stand if you're able for the reading. Today's reading comes from Jonah 2, 6b through 9. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What have I vowed I will make good? I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. We also have a reading from Jonah 3, 10 to 4, 3. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Give us eyes to see the world the way that you see it. Give us ears to hear your voice. Hearts to receive what you would give to us today. And make us bold. Make us bold as we attempt to be your hands and feet in this very broken world. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we began this series, I ask you to do a few things, and some of you all are doing well, and some of you all not so much, and some of you all are just stubborn and won't do anything anybody asks you to do. I fall into that category very often. But I ask you all if you would make church attendance a priority so that you can kind of connect the dots of all of these words of life sermons. I ask you to uh, bring your Bibles and look up sermons or on your electronic device uh, or the scriptures uh, on your electronic device or your Bible and uh, then go home and the week afterward read the entire book that uh, the words of life that focus came from and then see do you determine that that these are actual words of life and you agree with with the sermon or you disagree with it and and if you do agree that there are words of life to be found here um, what are you going to do to embrace these truths and apply them to your own life in other words will these words of life simply go in one ear and out the other Or will you take hold and and see what you can do with them? We're into week six, and I want to review briefly um, for you where we've been. Week one was Micah. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Week two was Jeremiah. About seeking God with your whole heart. God will set you free. And God has plans to give, give you a future that contains hope. God has big plans for your life. He wants to give you a future with hope. Week three, Habakkuk. Some of you all learned a new name. Habakkuk, do it again, Daddy. Make your power and presence known once again in our day. Zephaniah offered us hope in the midst of life's struggles. Steph and I was convinced that in the midst of the struggles of our life, God is present and God offers hope. And we have the benefit of hindsight. We know that what he was prophesying about or preaching about or foretelling about was Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus Christ is that hope. Last week, Susan shared with you about Ezekiel, about God breathing new life into dry bones about Ezekiel's call to revive the dry bones and how that relates to us. How Ezekiel was called to be a watchman. And we were called to be watchmen also or watch women also. But not necessarily of everyone in our world, but the watch person begins with us. 
taking a look at our own life and being stewards of our own life. Judgment was not the last word. This week is Jonah, okay? And this book is different than the other prophetic books from most of the prophetic books in the Bible because this one focuses on the story of the prophet more so than the prophecies that the prophet speaks. Does that make sense? Focuses more on his story and less on what he's talking about. Therefore, the words that I have to share with you today, the words of life, are not Jonah's words, but rather an observation of the life or of parts of the life of Jonah, at least what we know. Thus, wishy-washy hypocrites are welcome here. Wishy-washy hypocrites are welcome here. That's it. That is the best I got out of this whole book, okay? Um, what is a wishy-washy hypocrite and where is here okay is here at hillside yes is it in the united methodist church yes is it to our religion or to the big church c worldwide yes is is here at the foot of the cross yes is here into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God, the presence of God? And the answer is yes. That, that's the here. As far as the hypocrite goes, most of you all are saying, I may not be able to define it, but I can sure point it out when I see it. Have you ever heard someone describe a church or the church as nothing but a bunch of hypocrites and then go away saying that that's the reason why they will not attend or participate or no longer are a part of church or reject our faith or even reject God because it's nothing but a bunch of of hypocrites. I don't want to be known as one of those hypocrites. I don't want to be associated with those hypocrites. I don't want to sit in the same pew or row with the rest of those hypocrites. What exactly is a hypocrite? Okay, I said, I don't know how to define it, but I certainly know it when I see it. A simple definition, according to Merriam-Webster, who apparently is the authority on all words in the English language, even some that you didn't know were added, okay? Look those up too. But a person who claims or pretends to have certain beliefs about what is right, but who behaves in a way that disagrees with those beliefs is a hypocrite. Expand upon that. A person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or religion. A person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings would be defined as a hypocrite. So a hypocrite is a person who says he or she believes one thing or claims they have a certain moral standard, yet the way in which they live their life is not consistent with those same morals or values or belief or faith that they pro profess to own. Someone who says one thing and does another. That's a hypocrite. And I would love to tell you otherwise but to be completely honest with you, your pastor is a hypocrite. I often think or behave in a way that is not pleasing to God. I say things, words, sentences, phrases, paragraphs that dishonor God. I have ungodly and selfish motives. My thoughts, my thoughts are not always pure. My actions... My actions do not always honor the God that I claim to love and serve. They're not always consistent with what I say I believe. And on many occasions, and on some occasions, I continue to be the poster child for hypocrisy. 
Now, that may not be true of some of you, but unfortunately, it is true of me. And if that bursts your bubble about your pastor, I'm sorry. If I were perfect all on my own, I would have no need of God's grace, nor would I need a Savior to do for me what I cannot do for myself. But I am, and I do. So what does all this have to do with Jonah? I want to tell you the complete story of Jonah, not the simplified, cleaned up, kiddie version that we tell our kids. We all know that version, right? Okay, the kid version. Jonah. God says, Jonah, go to, Tar- go to Nineveh and preach the good news to Nineveh. Tell them to repent. All of our kids that, that learn from an early age, go tell them about God. Jonah refuses. He goes to run away. He gets on a boat headed for Tarshish. Most of us don't even know where that was or what boat he got on or what sea he got into. But, okay, that's for another day. Look it up. He gets on a boat. Storm comes. Sailors figure out that it's Jonah that's causing all this. God must want to punish him. They do what? Throw him overboard. What happens? A fish comes along, swallows him up. And Jonah spends three nights in the hotel of the belly of the fish with room service, right? Seaweed and all that sort of stuff. And then Jonah prays to God. We leave that part out, by the way, to our kids. This fish miraculously spits him up on dry ground, and Jonah does what? He goes and preaches to the people of Nineveh. They all repent, and everyone does what? They live. You know the story happily ever after that's the cleaned up kitty version okay so what actually happened that's kind of what happened but it doesn't end there god tells jonah i love the people of nineveh they are wicked sinful people and i want you to go tell them how much i love them and they need to repent of their sin now we tend to churchize that, Christianize that. They were wicked. They were involved in everything outside of the the moral standards that we claim we profess. They were they they had it. It was the place to be in the ancient world. Okay, you heard of the the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. One of them being the the hanging gardens of Babylon. This is where they believed they originated. Before Babylon, there was Assyria, and this was the capital city, and it was a glorious city. And it was the the poster child for success in the ancient world. But it was wicked and evil and knew nothing of God. And so God told Jonah, I want you to go talk to these people. And Jonah said, I don't want to go talk to these people. Why did Jonah not want to go talk to these people? It's revealed later in the story. He just didn't like them. They're wicked. Those people are not worthy of hearing the message of God. So he runs away, tries to get away from God, as we all know you can't do that. Thus the story of God sending a storm, the sailors throwing him overboard, swallowed up by a fish, and fish spits him out onto dry ground after Jonah prays to God and confesses his own sin confesses the condition of his own heart, admits why he didn't want to go. I know you are gracious and merciful. I know you will forgive them, and they are not worthy of forgiveness, so I don't want to go, but because you say so, I will. Jonah gets spit on the dry ground. God calls him again, go to the people of Nineveh. So he goes, and he preaches a message of repentance. Three days he preaches to the people of Nineveh. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Turn to God. Tell them about the God of heaven, whom they knew nothing of. Miraculously, what happens? The king hears of this, and his heart is turned, and he repents. He says, we are a wicked people. Put sackcloth on and ashes. That's a symbol of mourning, of, of confession. And encourages the entire nation, the entire city, to do this. And so they have this fast for three days. They still celebrate this in the ancient world. And they confess their sin. And you would think 
that Jonah was high-fiving everybody walking out of the city saying, this is awesome, look at God. Man, you are turning these people back to you. But no, Jonah goes outside of the city, sits down and sulks. Why? Because God made him look like a fool. Because the message he was told to proclaim was, God is going to destroy you if you do not turn from your sin and your wicked ways. And guess what? They turned, and God did not destroy them. God did not level the city. And so Jonah went outside the city, and he saw it. See, I knew this is why I didn't want to go to preach to those people in the first place. They're nothing like me. They're not Jewish. They're not your chosen people. They're sinful. They're wicked. They don't even believe in you. They do one thing. They say another. They're a bunch of hypocrites, God. And I don't want to go tell them that you love them because you may do exactly what it is you do, God, which is you will change the human heart. They will confess their sin. They will express their desire and their need for a relationship with God and you will forgive them and you will love them you will change them and they are not worthy of your love so Jonah sulks and he sits outside the city and he whines and he waits what's he waiting for? see he preached 40 days God's going to level the city what was he waiting for? He was waiting, waiting for God to level the city because he hated those people. So God, in his compassion for Jonah, sends a vine that crawls up on his shelter and provides shade. It's a long way of saying God made him comfortable. God provided creature comforts for him. And Jonah enjoyed it as he sat and waited for the city to burn. Turn or burn. Kingdom of heaven is near. And so what happened? He enjoyed it for a day. And then God causes a worm to come and eat the vine. And the plant withers and dies. And then we're told God sends this rushing warm wind and sun and heat and all that. Jonah's out in the hot desert. And what does he do now? He now complains that the plant is no longer there. The creature comforts, which he did nothing to earn, he had no no stake in. The goodness of God that was lavished on him for a single day, he had nothing to do with it. He had not earned it. He was not worthy of it. God offered it to him. And then God took it away. And so Jonah, Jonah was angry at God. God's response was, you're more concerned about that plant and your creature comforts and how you look before other people and what you do or don't do than you are about 120,000 people inside a city that will spend eternity apart from God all because you didn't care. The story reveals the hypocrisy of Jonah's own heart. He didn't want to go preach to them because he didn't like them. Plain and simple. He believed that the Israelites and and he were worthy of forgiveness and mercy and love and grace. But did not believe that about other people. He was judge and jury and pronounced the sentence and used God to justify it all. And we do the same. We do the same. We get up on our soapboxes and our high horses and point our fingers at other people all the while we expect God's mercy and grace and forgiveness to run rampant in our lives. And we justify why we behave badly or think badly or do badly or don't care about the needs of others. 
never take a look inside the hypocrisy of our own human hearts. The dots that I've connected along the way as I've gone through this journey have all had to do with me, the condition of my heart, the reason why I do what I do. Some pastors have viewed today as an opportunity to speak truth in the lives of their people, to talk about the atrocities of our world and injustices. And that may be well and good, but that is not this pastor's calling. This pastor is called to speak truth into the lives of each individual. And I do not have the ability to change a human heart. I cannot fix what is broken in our world and I cannot fix what is broken in you no more than I can fix what is broken in me. I can only tell you that I know the one who can. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And I believe that our world will continue down the path it has always been on without the grace of God. And so I will use this day as I hope I will use every Sunday to tell you how much God loves you and how much God wants an intimate relationship with you and how desperately, desperately He longs for you to be close to him so he can change your heart. And then, then you can walk outside of these walls and live out your convictions in our world. And what that looks like to you, I can't tell you. I don't have the answers for you. I can't tell you the way you should vote, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. But I do not believe that the church, I do not believe the mission of the church, the purpose of any church, is to go down the path of only social justice issues. Because it's the why. It's the why do you get concerned about the condition of your neighbor? Why do you love your neighbor? Why are you moral and ethical in your business dealings? Why do you weep over hatred and violence and all the other things? To me, the position of this pastor and the position of the church is the why matters. And I'm a hypocrite. I'd love to tell you that I live my life in a way that everybody could look at me and say, he's a pastor, he represents God, he always does what he says he will do. And I don't. And all I can do is ask for your forgiveness and try to do better tomorrow. But today, hear this. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and the condition of your human heart can only be repaired by God. And the condition of our world can only be repaired through Jesus Christ. Let's pray and then we're going to...